Word nerd. Wordsmith. Wordy. Wordless. Oxford Dictionary says a word is a single, distinct, meaningful element of speech or writing, used with others or sometimes alone. We say each one matters. No extra words is literature, minimalist style. And we're getting you right to the story. Spring Cleaning It was a beautiful April morning and Donald decided to clean out his mind. One by one he set his childhood traumas out by the curb. The death of his father, the elevator accident, the nights he was sent to bed hungry. Then he began to set his petty fears along the same curb. Fear of being alone in a wood. Fear of the texture of marshmallows. Fear that spiders were hiding in his slippers. When he had finished, he went back inside, poured himself a mint tea, and sat by the window. Almost immediately, people came to pick through the pile. The petty fears went first. Ooh, said a woman who reminded Donald of his Aunt Carol. I can clean this up and put it on the mantel. She picked up Donald's fear of tone-deaf singers and placed it in her bag. A pair of scrappers came and took the elevator accident, though they had trouble getting it into their truck. All afternoon, people came and went until all that remained was the death of Donald's father, which sat there, weeping. Donald went out, gathered the thing up, and brought it back inside. Here, he said, proffering a cup, there's still some tea left. And the two sat in silence, looking out at the empty street. Hello there. Welcome to No Extra Words, the flash fiction podcast. My name is Chris Baker Dersh. I'm your producer and editor. Charles O'Hay's poem really sets us up well today, both in the reading and in its tone, because today's episode is all about stuff, food, garage sales, storage lockers, all that everyday stuff that at the end of the day isn't so everyday, is it? So coming up is an additional poem and two more stories all about the stuff behind the stuff. Before we do that, though, will you permit me a short diversion? Because I want to talk to you a little bit about how wonderful National Poetry Month has been here on the No Extra Words podcast. Here's what happened in April, guys. We aired four regular episodes. We aired a baseball opening day special. We aired the third in our Meet the Author series all about Mary Alice Long. Here's what was supposed to happen in April. Four episodes, each featuring a poem. Get that? A poem. Instead, what we ended up doing between special episodes and regular episodes is we aired 11 poems and 10 stories and worked with 21 different contributors, not including the episode all about Mary Alice Long. It was so much fun, you guys. It was so much fun to bring you a little bit of poetry. It was so much fun, and we're doing it again this week, playing with that line between poetry and and prose. I mean, Char- Charles O'Hay's poem that kicked us off today is very much a poem, but think of it in terms of a flash fiction story. You're not too far off bounds. And then to also get to bring in the voices of the authors we've been interviewing and listen to them talk about how writing flash fiction feels very much like writing a poem because you're using words and language in that same very precise way. That was April, and we are coming into May now. May is going to take the poetry off the table a little bit. We're going to get back into hardcore focusing on short stories, on short fiction. We are bringing you the final of our four-part Meet the Author series. The Brianne Holmes special episode is coming in May. We're going to talk a little bit about moms and a little bit about Memorial Day and all the things that happen in May. And we are also working like busy bees to get ready for our 50th episode that is also our one-year celebration, and that's coming June 1st. If you have not yet visited our website, noextrawords.wordpress.com, and clicked on the link right there on the front page, please do so. You'll get to vote for your favorite story from our archives, and also send us that ever-so-important listener feedback for that 50th episode. 
Listener feedback can be anything. Tell us why you like writing flash fiction. Tell us why you like reading flash fiction. Tell us something about the show. Write a response to one of our stories that we've aired. Write a response to one of our poems that we've aired. Complain to us. Compliment us. Challenge us. Sky's the limit, folks. The only limit that you have is that survey is going to close after Friday. Friday, April 29th is the final day. So get those votes and listener feedback in by then. In the meantime, here comes more about the stuff behind the stuff. We're going to finish you out with bam, 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 three back-to-backers, and we will see you in May here on No Extra Words, the Flash Fiction Podcast. Storage. The memory of you was too big to stuff in the storage closet, too ungainly of a bulk to fit entirely among the winter clothes, though I tried. But while I couldn't very well leave you in the middle of the living room, where I would have to walk around you every day to get to the kitchen, and guests might trip unexpectedly on your legs, neither could I bring myself to throw you out. So I hacked you into smaller pieces. Wrapped and labeled into bags like chapters of gestures and glances, laughter and raw eyes, redistributed for easy storage, and tucked them wherever they would fit. Every once in a while, I find a piece of you, in an upstairs cupboard or alongside unworn boots on my closet floor. Once I stumbled across the smell of your deodorant while looking for the good tablecloth, and another time I glimpsed that night in your car before letting the lid of the shoebox drop again and walking away. Oreo by Len Kuntz. All I do now is eat. There's nothing else that captivates me. I'm not choosy either. I'll put anything in my mouth. At the grocery store, I pile one cart high, pay, fill the trunk, then return for another. In no time, I'm as big as a refrigerator. It becomes hard to move, so I don't. I lounge on the sofa, sinking down in the cushions as if I'm sitting in quicksand. I pile stacks of junk food around me so I don't have to get up. I take photos of what I'm eating and post them on my Facebook page. Looks yummy, someone writes. People come and go in and out of my house. No one says anything about how large I've gotten, so I take that to mean I've got a ways to go until my consumption becomes a problem. One day, I can't lift myself off the sofa. I try and try, but it's no use. I think about calling a friend or 911, but my cell phone is dead. I think about death and all the food I'd leave behind if I died. I wonder how long I can go without food before dying, if I can get thin enough to raise myself from the couch. An uneaten double-stuffed Oreo, round and layered like me, sits near my thigh, staring accusingly. To make him disappear, I eat him. He tastes gooey, soft, like a cloud, Or maybe a bit like... Heaven. Soup by Tino Mori My mother always refused to make real soup while I was growing up. Too dangerous, she said, winding the can opener around the can of kidney beans. It's against the law, and for good reason. She did let me order certain soups at restaurants when my father got a promotion. She watched me slurp little spoonfuls of creamed tomato with her fingers clamped around the edges of the table. She'll be fine, my father would say, not looking up from his salad. They wouldn't serve a real soup here in a restaurant. They know better. They wouldn't want to be sued. 
My mother would have her steak folded up in aluminum foil to eat for breakfast. No matter how hungry she had been before, my mother's appetite was always gone when I announced my food choice. When I asked her why soup made her so anxious, she just shook her head. I think she hoped staring at me would deter my appetite, but soup was just too delightful, and the risk just enticed me more. When my father rose to department manager, I drank jambalaya. When he became vice president of marketing, I indulged in a vixen of French onion soup. When I graduated high school, my parents let me taste a bouillabaisse for the first time. I lay on my back for many nights after, staring up into the darkness and smiling at the gentle exuberance of the flavor. At my wedding, the caterers put out little bowls of salmon and leek. My husband loved it almost as much as I did, though he said he would have preferred whitefish. Even my mother ate some. She looked so lonely, and we both missed my father very much on that happy day. After the twins were born, my desire to return to the news agency had dimmed. I stacked up copies of The New Yorker and Sunset Magazine. I read Chekhov and O'Hara. I made mashed butternut squash, creamed peas, thick pastes of gooey sustenance. The twins grew into their teeth, grew into gnashing appetites. They wanted asparagus and beetroot, not chicken soup and beef stew. There were many arguments around the polished oak table. I shouted more there than anywhere else. My tastes changed, too. I developed an appreciation for coffee during the custody trial, buying a French press to fill my new countertop. The caffeine did not affect me much. I just liked the way it settled on my tongue, hot and heavy. The bitterness was my favorite part. I ate frozen ravioli during my job search. I continued to eat the soggy, starchy packets while I pored over newsletter copy, trying to preserve the writer's ego without lying. I'd pry open a can of carrot soup whenever an episode of Full House comes on the television, rather than change the channel. I often wondered what sex with Bob Saget would be like. I had been at the marketing firm for three years, and dabbling in online dating for the last two, when I decided to make the soup. My boyfriend at the time was out of town, so I went to the store, bought a rotisserie chicken, several onions, carrot stalks of celery, and lots of garlic. Broth recipes, of course, were censored online, but I found an archaic cookbook at Bell's secondhand bookstore, which I shoplifted with a pounding heart. I knew what to do. I cut the tender meat away from the chicken bones, sealed it in glass Tupperware to eat with rice later. I took the bones and the gristle and all the rest, putting it in my iron pot. I poured three quarts of boiling water on the carcass, turned the heat to medium, and set the lid at a jaunty angle. I sliced the ten onions carefully, the heavy blade slicing the root and dried skin away. But I left the denuded onion tops, gathering them up in my hands and dropping them into the pot first. I diced four onions and added those too, but saved the rest for an onion soup one rainy day. I peeled the carrots lovingly, thinking of tumbling college afternoons of hummus and picnic blankets. I chopped crisp coins from each root, tossed them under the lid, then ran the celery under cold water. The knife hit the board with a satisfying clump, and I poured the heap of celery bits into the broth. I stirred, resisting the glorious aroma. My forehead and neck were growing damp from condensation, but I couldn't open the blinds or windows, otherwise the smell might drift out to an upstanding neighbor. I would taste real soup today. The broth was slowly realizing itself. I could sense it. My cells were vibrating. Happy bubbles splashed over the onion fragments and the chicken bones. I wanted to keep cooking it, but instead I added salt. Just enough. It sat cooling for twenty long minutes before I ran the broth through a strainer and poured it back into the large pot. I skimmed away the fat, took a deep breath, and stared at the translucent miracle. My mind felt fuzzy from the smell. With trembling fingers, I scooped a cupful from the pot and sat down at the kitchen table. There were no chunks in this soup. It was not pureed. I was done with illusion and half-truths and postmodernism. I wanted to drink the soup. The first sip burnt my tongue. My next mouthful spilled tears from my eyes, tears not nearly as salty, but just as pure. My third taste was sweet and savory and smooth and rich. I finished the cup, then I finished a second cup. I filled the bowl over and over again until the pot sat empty on the stove. I sat on the kitchen floor, staring at the microwave, telling me the time. I cried then in earnest. I cried until my eyes were as dry as the pot. I tapped out the familiar number on my phone, but their stepmother answered. She let me speak to her husband first, and he was startled by my words, by my incoherence. 
The twins were both entering the science fair. I lowered my head to my knees when they told me. It was past their bedtime. I hung up. I curled up in my bed that night, afraid I would not find any sleep. But sleep found me. My mouth still tingled. I had not brushed my teeth. Thanks for listening to the No Extra Words podcast. For more information on today's stories and contributors, or to learn how to submit your own work, please visit us at noextrawords.wordpress.com. The best support you can give the show is to recommend us to your family and friends. See you next time.